The role of an architect has been defined by over several uh, centuries actually as to what an architect is, whether it was the Medicis of Florence or whether they were the, what I call the robber barons of East India Company or the merchant princes of the industrialized revolution or even the tech giants, you know, the corporate sector today. Uh, architects have always believed that they're there to serve the most wealthy and the most exclusive uh, clientele. And uh, I was trained in the last century, actually, so it was a long time ago, and I was brought up in the same kind of way, thinking that I, did, I needed to have a really large ego to be able to produce stuff that I could be proud of and my clients would be proud of. So one indulged in really enormous amount of extravagance. And I, being an architect in Pakistan, even I had this whole opportunity. And then the time came when I understood that it no longer mattered. If you serve a few people, you do the best that you are, you can do this amazing kind of uh, uh, basically iconic buildings, but finally it touches very few people. And the world today now needs design services for another cause. Because I think what architects have is this amazing skill and aptitude for design. And that is needed when you have disparities, when you have deficiency of resources, when you have a whole mass of people who have nothing. And to relate to them, and you can, because as an architect, you are trained to, uh, to think of the context, to design for the context. And also we are taught this amazing ability of coordination with all kinds of different disciplines. Uh, we know how to think of our clients. And if you consider the poor people as your client, then you will think in that way. So I think that architects are the best people to serve humanity today. But we have to change the, the whole definition of architecture or architect. I think that's exactly right, that we need to change the way we think of what an architect can do, how they can actually serve others compared to what we've been doing all our lives, basically. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how if you have really restricted resources, is the part of design that will make use of it. If you want to use a lot of waste material, is the design of the architect that will make it happen. So when we talk of circular economy, we talk of using, reusing everything, we talk of, uh, you know, retrofitting or, 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 or working through, you know, whatever you have left and not to add carbon to the whole environment. That is the key and I think a duty of all, not only architects, but also other built environment professionals like engineers, uh, urban designers, all the people who are fashioning an urban or any kind of environment, built environment. We should all be thinking of how now we can save the planet. That is our duty now. I think more than that, actually, it's more than just uh, uh, talking about the Western ideas. It's right, like really decolonization of architecture. It's really like democratization of architecture. So you don't anymore cater for, you know, for, for one entity or somebody who has the power, uh, but you, you, it's a democratic way of practicing where you are then talking to people, you're working with them. You don't feel that you're above them, you are with them. So rather than treating them as, as people who have the ability, you treat them as partners. Now that a lot of time it means giving up control, relinquishing control, because that's what we've been taught, that we must control everything we do. And we do, we have to, because we're doing these mega structures like where we are sitting today, there has to be control of everything. And I was the same. When I designed those buildings, very large ones uh, in concrete or steel and with, you know, all kinds of reflective glass and aluminum and so on, everything had to be just perfect. If it wasn't, the contractor had to demolish it because it wasn't right. But today, 
I, I just operate in a different manner. My, I feel that my duty is to see that whatever I design is strong. But beyond that, people who live in them have, have the complete control of how they want to treat it. And they can personalize it. It's no longer my design. It's become a co-created kind of a product. You know, I think finally, uh, when we look at uh, the whole field of building, uh, it's, it's really a very large number of people who use it. It's not only those who can pay for our services and who have uh, also the power to, you know, build very expensive structures. Most of the people do not have anything. And so the question is, can architects now relate to those conditions? Whether it's the slums in all urban centers, and we know that uh, since we are talking of sustainability and of the SDGs and carbon emissions, we know that uh, actually urban centers everywhere in the world are the battleground for climate change. So they are very important that we don't have really slums anymore so that everybody has the same quality of life. Because remember we had COVID not so long ago and it equalized all of us. COVID didn't distinguish who was living in a palace or who was living in a shack. It affected everybody. And that I think should have had a very kind of humanizing impact on all of us. But we forget very easily. So today again, we are in the pursuit of, again, you know, something more always. But I think the more we now concentrate on doing good for others, the better place it would be to live in this world. Well, this, I think this is a, a million dollar question as to how do we reach our goals. And you know what, I'm hearing so much from young people who really want to go in that way. So many of them. Because you know, I feel that with my architecture, my architecture is to be used to give agency to those who don't have a voice. So women who are oppressed, they're able to express themselves with their own creative activity within those structures, which they personalize because they use their this power of, of design themselves. They also have a power of design, which is amazing. It's different, but it's there. And they get dignity. And that's another thing we can need to do with, with architecture. That's, architecture is the tool to be used in so many ways to uplift people who have nothing. So I think there's a whole, uh, there's so much there that we can do in terms of, uh, again, making sure that everybody has a decent way of living. And uh, I think young people really understand the difficulties that are there today, whether it's the climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's, uh, you know, the very, uh, the densities that are now getting into the cities and how living is becoming so difficult for so many people. The young want to change the world. And I think it's the job of our generation, responsibility of our generation to try to do that. So that people who want to practice in that way, young practices who've just graduated, they want to do it, but they don't have a support right now. So I would very much like institutions such as UIA, all the institutions that come under them, all the institutes of architects. And I've been president of one you know, many decades ago. So I know the system and I think they have great power. They have a great outreach. So if they could uh, be the medium through which we could provide funding to universities through the building product manufacturers who are normally very rich and there's a lot of money there. Uh, and we provide that, our institutes provide that funding to universities and universities provide what I call an architectural incubator space within universities. So they can be mentored and they can be supported. So for two years, at least, like the tech industry does, why can't we do it for our professionals, our young people, to nurture them, to find a way for them to be able to practice so that was one thing, and I'm very happy today we had a good discussion, Natalie, and there was a whole group of uh, committee members of UIA from different institutes. We discussed as to how we can open up the field to young people and how can we help them. So another idea was to see how the 
how these uh, very flourishing architectural practices could help and uh, and so on. So I've suggested that maybe there should be a pro bono wing in many of these practices who will, like the legal profession, who are there to help communities. We can do the same. And there are young people who want to do it, so why can't we help them? Another idea was how could you uh, do this uh, community service, like the national service and so on, uh, which could be related to design and improving the lives of people. There's so much that architects can do, actually, you know. It's a very strong profession. And uh, there's a lot of networking. There's a lot of outreach. And if that could be used for the good of younger professionals, won't that be nice? It's a very good question as to what the Global North can do now. Because Global South has all these issues and problems. But Global North is also no, not free of problems. You also have climate change impact. You have sea levels rising. You have urban flooding. You have urban heat islands in so many countries in the Global North. Uh, you have, you know, a biggest issue of uh, conflict migrants congregating. And many countries, there, there's so much homelessness. So there is so much that's going on in which I feel as a profession, architects are not engaged where they should be now to be doing that. But you don't have to go, go far to learn. You have your fantastic, in Europe particularly, these amazing medieval towns where all the techniques were there, where people lived in a different manner, when there were lower densities. You know, I mean, you, there's something called uh, medium density, but, you know, uh, low rise. We don't have to achieve the highest density. Why are we doing that? Because it's so high carbon. But we've had our traditional towns where there was really pretty high density, but it was a very humanistic environment. It was really for people. So you don't have to go far. Your own medieval towns are there. They are so beautiful. And we can all learn from each other. But I really feel that, you know, there's a slogan which says, Tra traditional urbanism is equal to eco-urbanism. So eco-urbanism is something really, really important today. Because if we look at the ecological aspects of everything, then we will change the way we design our urban centers. We will change the way we are building. We will change the way we have our streets. We will not have so much vehicular traffic, which is just emitting fumes all the time. Uh, however much you might bring in your electrical cars, but still, and then, uh, I mean, why do we have everything for vehicles? What about human beings? I mean, you have a lot of pedestrian areas, but I find that in, in the countries in the West, there's not enough vegetation. I mean, now, because in our country, shade is always very important. But here too, you need that to clean the air. And I mean, not so much maybe in Copenhagen because it's so clean, I'm, I'm amazed. I, <laughs> you know, when I came, I was looking for the green domes because that's what I remember when I visited 60 years ago. And uh, uh, so somebody told me that because there's no pollution, so the, 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 the copper is not go turning green. That's a very good sign, but you lost your green, beautiful green domes. But that's a good thing, you know. And now what we have to do is to look at different examples, like there's a sponge city concept in China, or there's a Miyawaki forest in, in Japan. And, and there's so much that's happening in the world that we need to combine to see what is good for us. Because you have to deal with urban flooding. You have to deal with urban heat islands everywhere. Because the globe is warming up. So in my country, in my own city, in Karachi, I've done an eco enclave. It's worked so well, I can't tell you. It's got the Miyawaki forests, it's got sponge pavements, it's got aquifer wells. Ah, we have to work with water. We have to find ways to be friends with it rather than trying to see how to get rid of it, you know? So there's much we can think about. We all need to think about it together and we need to see how we can help each other, support each other to do the right thing.